Here we are at uh, lesson number 12 in our study of 1 Corinthians, first letter of Paul to the Corinthian church. Uh, I would ask you to open to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14. That's where we're going to be uh, in our lesson today, talking about order in worship, order in worship. Last time, uh, in our last uh, lesson, we, we studied the opening section of this particular chapter, which laid out the basic theme of the entire chapter. And Paul often does this, uh, gives the summary of what he's going to talk about right up front, and then breaks it down in the following verses. He does this again in, verse, in chapter 14. And basically he's saying, uh, I'll do just a little review of what we did last time. Basically he's saying there are many gifts given by God uh, to the church, but uh, the gift of prophecy, and we talked about last, uh, that we talked about last week, prophecy in this context meaning not only the ability to speak about something in the future, but also the ability to speak God's word at the present time. Today we call that preaching or, or teaching uh, the word. So that particular gift, uh, Paul was saying, is the most important gift because it is through this gift that God accomplishes several necessary things for the church. And uh, as we studied last week, uh, Paul said that first of all, the gift of preaching is necessary for the edification of the, uh, of the church, the building up of the church. Uh, the building up of the church uh, into spiritual maturity is done through the gift of preaching. He also said that um, exhortation is done through preaching. In other words, giving direction uh, to individuals and to the church as a body, giving it direction. Uh, that term exhortation uh, is what that means. And then the third thing he talked about was consolation. So you had edification, exhortation, consolation. Consolation is comforting. Comforting the church, comforting individuals. Again, this is done through uh, the preaching and the teaching of God's word. And so Paul explained last time that these are the things that the church needs in order to remain alive, in order to remain uh, in a state of growth, uh, in order to be comforted in times of difficulty, in order to know the direction that it should go. Uh, edification, exhortation, consolation, and all of these things are done through the gift of prophecy or preaching. So I could add that in another passage, Paul also says that preaching is important because it is the manner in which God calls men to be saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. So we talked about that a few lessons back. Now, the reason that they needed this reminder was that in this particular congregation at uh, Corinth, there existed a number of gifted men and women, and Paul had to teach them the true purpose and the true way to use their gift. It seems, uh, if you kind of read between the lines of his epistle, it seems that some of them were using their gift of preaching to debate each other or to create uh, a following. Imagine that, they were using their gift in order to try to create a group that would follow that particular teacher uh, exclusively. Others were using their special abilities to speak in uh, un, uh, you know, unlearned languages, we said that was the gift of tongues, and he says that some people were using the gifts of tongues simply to show off, just to show that they had some sort of spiritual superiority to other people. So he begins by teaching them the role of the primary gift, which is prophecy, and then he moves on to explain the purpose and the manner of usage for the other gifts in the church, which brings us to our lesson today. So the secondary theme that summarizes the second part of this chapter is found in verse, uh, in verse 40, where he says, but let all things be done properly and in an orderly manner. Let all things, now he's talking about public worship, let all things be done um, in an orderly, properly and in a, an orderly manner. Uh, properly from the word propriety, meaning let things be done in a decent fashion, 
in a gracious fashion, in an honorable way. We need to act in an honorable way uh, in the church. And he says in an orderly fashion, orderliness, things that are arranged, things that are orderly, the opposite of confusion. His point is, let, let's not have confusion in the church. And you wonder, well, why no confusion? Because when there's confusion, uh, there's, there's no order, there's no growth in confusion. When there's confusion, there's division, there's arguing, uh, there are troubles, people begin to lose their faith. So the instructions he gives in verses six all the way down to 38 are those which will guarantee propriety and orderliness in the public assembly, especially among those who are misusing and misunderstanding the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of tongues. Remember, the, the problem is there's disorder and dishonor in the church, largely because the people who have the gifts are not using them in a proper way. The people who have the gifts of prophecy are using them to kind of you know, uh, uh, gather a following to themselves. The people who have the gifts of tongue are, are, are debating and fighting with each other for preeminence. So now he's going to go ahead and, and teach them how you properly use these spiritual gifts that you have been given. Now he's already explained the purposes for the gifts of prophecy. Now he focuses um, on the gift of tongues. And he says, first of all, that the gift of tongues uh, is given for instruction. That's the purpose of that gift. It was a gift through which the church received some form of instruction, but received it in a supernatural way, rather than simple natural communication. Remember what we said last week, someone who spoke in a tongue was a person who could speak an unknown language. In other words, I gave the example, if I could speak Chinese or Mandarin, for example, without ever having studied that language. That was what the miracle was. And so he, he says, this is how you use this, this gift of tongues. It's for instruction, he says. So let's read verse six, chapter 14, as we continue our study. He says, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you, unless I speak to you either by way of revelation, or of knowledge, or of prophecy, or of teaching? So he says, what good is the foreign language, the tongues? What good is that, if I, uh, the tongues that I speak, rather, unless it instructs you in some manner? And he, he mentions several ways to be instructed. He says, unless, you know, what good is it if I speak Mandarin, unless I come to you and I give you, through that miracle, some form of revelation? In other words, I reveal to you what was until now unknown, and I do it through divine inspiration. And what good is me speaking in a miraculous way if, if you don't learn something that you didn't know? Or what good is it if I don't bring you some knowledge? In other words, the ability to accumulate and analyze information accurately. What good is that miracle if, if after I have spoken, you don't have any knowledge? And then he says prophecy, speaking God's word concerning the past or present or future. What good is that unknown language if I'm not telling you something that is about to take place or give you insight about something that has happened in the past? And then he mentions the fourth thing, teaching. What good is this miraculous language that I have if I am not able to give you the application and the explanation in very practical terms of, of the Christian religion? What good is it? If what I am saying does not serve you in one of these ways, he says, what profit, what good is my speech? And so he goes on. In verse seven, he said, yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So here Paul compares a language that no one understands to different musical instruments. And he says that each instrument has a distinct and recognizable sound 
that helps the listener to identify it. You, can, you, know, you could close your eyes and say, oh, that's a violin, or that's a piano. Here he said, that's a bugle, this is a flute. And he even gives an example. He says, you hear the bugle, and the bugle is effective because its distinctive sound instructs you to prepare for battle. It was used in war. And so he continues the thought in verse 9, 10, and 11. He says, so also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be to the one who speaks a barbarian and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So now he demonstrates that language is the same. Each language has its own sound or its own meaning. And I want you to notice something in verse 10. Notice in verse 10, I'll go back to that, where's verse 10 here? He says, there are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world. He's talking about known languages. They may not be known to him, he may not be able to speak all those languages, but they are human languages. He's not talking about spiritual languages here, he's not talking about the language of angels or some unknown language unknown to man, that's not what he's talking about. And that's important because today, in, in charismatic circles, when they try to defend the idea that they're speaking this miraculous language, the argument is, oh, it's not a human language. You can't understand it. Only the angels can understand it. But in the Bible, in the very section that actually talks about this particular gift, Paul refers to this gift as a language, a human language. And so, he demonstrates that language is the same. Each language has its own sound, its own meaning. If one understands the meaning or the sound of that language, then that person receives instructions. However, if people do not understand each other's languages, even if they know each other, he says it's like speaking to a barbarian. C'est la même chose si moi je parlais en français pour vous, et j'essayais de vous enseigner cette leçon en français. Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un ici qui comprend ce que je viens juste de dire? Well, one guy back there. Yeah, well, I'm speaking in French and I simply said, if I were to speak in French and give this lesson in French, how many of you would understand what I'm saying? And the only one, uh, the only one that, that, that understands uh, that uh, language, and that's Rich back there who speaks French. Remember, the purpose of tongues, Paul says, is for instruction. So if there's no understanding, then there's no instruction, and the purpose of that miracle, uh, that miraculous gift, is defeated. So he goes on, verse 12 to 17. He says, so also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I shall pray with the spirit and I shall pray with the mind also. I shall sing with the spirit and I shall sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks? since he does not know what you are saying. For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. So Paul continues in his discourse on this particular subject. He says, don't be selfish. If, you're, if your gift, excuse me, your gift must edify. Your gift must serve in some way. It has to edify and serve the entire church, not just yourself. If you speak in a tongue that no one, including yourself, understands, he says, you may feel good inwardly that you are doing something special, but nobody else is being served by it. So Paul encourages them to seek for the complementary gift of interpretation so that everyone can be blessed by the gift. We'll explain that in a second here. Verse 18 and 19, to finish out the thought, he says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, that's the first time I've seen y'all in the Bible, but anyways. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. 
However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind that I may instruct all others also, rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. So Paul acknowledges that he possesses the gift of tongues more than they, but if there are no interpreters for his tongues, he'd rather speak in their own language so that they can understand what he's saying. He says, you know, if there's no one to interpret what you're saying, then you may feel good that you have this miraculous gift, but nobody else is being edified. Therefore, it's better that you don't say anything. It's better than you, sp you speak the language you know to, you know, even if all you know is five words, that's better than having a miraculous tongue and, and, and no one understand you. So the first purpose for this gift is to provide instruction and to do it in a miraculous way, not just to show off. All right, the second reason for this gift of tongues, he goes on, he says it's for a sign. It's for a sign. It was a gift that provided a sign to unbelievers that what was being said was actually from God. So we continue in verse 20. Remember this whole section just about tongues. He says, brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be babes, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. So the first purpose for the gift of tongues was instruction. The second purpose, he says, was as a sign. It was a gift that provided a sign to those who did not believe that what was being said was actually from God. So Paul explains that this miracle was prophesied long ago in connection with the coming of the gospel. He says, according to the Old Testament, it would be a signal that the gospel was being preached. Remember, the apostles were the first to demonstrate it on Pentecost. They were speaking in unknown languages. And those who heard them and who knew the prophecies concerning the Messiah and the coming of the kingdom and so on and so forth, understood this idea that when that era, when that time would come, those who would announce it would be speaking in foreign tongues. They didn't quite understand what that meant. Would it be foreigners who would come and, and preach to them? But with the miracle done by the apostles, that passage became clear. God empowered individual Jews to speak in languages that they didn't know. And it was important also because on the day of Pentecost there were people from all over the world that had come to Jerusalem for that particular feast. People that spoke in many languages. And so it was important for the apostles who were, to announce, who were announcing the, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time to be able to reach all the people in the audience, not just those who were uh, Jewish. This also demonstrates why this gift faded. It was given as a sign that the promise of the Old Testament had finally arrived. And it was a gift more significant to the Jews actually than the Gentiles, since it referred to the Old Testament. The Gentiles were impressed because, uh, you know, the people of different languages were impressed because they saw these people you know, uh, performing a miracle, but the Jews were doubly impressed because they saw the miracle and they also saw the connection with the Old Testament. So in verse 23 and 25, Paul continues and he says, if therefore the whole church should assemble together and all speak in tongues, and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? But if all prophecy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So Paul creates a scenario where an unbeliever, an unbeliever or one without the gift, okay, enters a church where everyone is speaking tongues, but there are no interpreters. What does he say? Well, the unbeliever would not understand and probably think that everyone was crazy because of the confusion. But he says, if everyone prophesied, if everyone spoke 
in a language that could be understood and taught the word in a language that everyone could understood, this would convict and this would convert the unbeliever. You know, if I'm talking to uh, uh, Roy over here and I'm speaking to him in French and with all my heart and with all my soul I'm sharing with him the gospel and let's say he wasn't a, a Christian and I explained everything to him you know, with all my heart and soul and I did it. Would it serve him? You know, he'd say, well this guy sure feels strongly about what he's saying but I don't understand a word he's saying. That was the problem. So the equation then is that a tongue plus an interpretation equals a prophecy. Once you have prophecy, tongues and interpretation are not necessary. All right, so he goes on for, uh, with this, these instructions for orderly worship. Remember, that, let's remember this is what we're talking about here. How do we conduct ourselves you know, in public worship insofar as prophecy is concerned, insofar as speaking in tongues, you know, the use of gifts, how do we use those in public worship? So having explained the purpose of the two, tongues and interpretation, Paul now goes on to explain how orderly worship should be conducted. So we begin in verse 26. He says, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. And so the, again, he summarizes. He summarized at the beginning and then he broke it down. He summarizes once again. And he says, make sure that you are using your gift for the right purpose. And that is to bless and to build up the assembly. Okay, now he's going to go on and give some basic rules of order in public worship. Remember, he's always talking about when you assemble in public. When you assemble in public. All right, let's begin in verse 27. He says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. And let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but let them subject themselves, just as the law also says. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. So again, all of this, basic rules about conduct in public worship. Number one, he talks to those who are speaking in tongues and to those who speak in tongues, he says they should do it one at a time and no more than three with this gift should exercise it at any one time. I don't know about you, but I've been to some assemblies in the past where that, not here of course, but uh, some charismatic assemblies where that's not the case. Everybody's speaking in their tongues at the same time and it seems many times they haven't read this particular passage. They claim to have the gift, but they haven't read the passage that governs the gift. So Paul says after each, if you have a tongue, if you have that gift, he says after each one speaks, then the interpretation should be made by one person because that's the purpose of the gift for instruction. And it seems that the gift of interpretation was such that one person could interpret many kinds of tongues. Secondly, he says, if no one can interpret, then this gift should not be used publicly since no one is edified. The individual can only express it privately. They can be edified, they can speak this tongue between themselves and God, and God understands, and they're edified, they're encouraged, knowing that they have this particular gift. But if no one in the church is able to interpret, then they need to keep it to themselves. Then he says, in the same way, prophets, teachers, preachers, right, prophets, they need to take turns speaking. And when they are, when they are what they say is to be judged or discerned by the other prophets who have the gift of discernment or knowledge. The idea, I believe, was that in the first century, the gifts were interdependent. Tongues needed interpretation. 
Prophecy needed those who had knowledge and discernment. There was a cooperative nature that God had built into these gifts for the ultimate edification of the church. And the problem was these young Christians who had these mighty gifts were using them simply to build themselves up. So preachers and teachers took turns in an ongoing preaching and teaching uh, subject to each other's correction for the edification of the church and a guarantee of correct doctrine. Today we have the preachers or teachers, they teach at appointed times and they are subject to correction by each other and the elders and those in the congregation who have Bible knowledge because we all have, we all have, the, we all have access to the basic knowledge and those who have perhaps the ability to teach or to preach exercise that gift but all, always in a cooperative nature with those who have knowledge and discernment. Number four, he says, give the place to speak to the one that has a word from the Lord and do not all at the same time. It's like kindergarten. <laughs> Raise your hand, take your turn. So every prophet has a chance to speak, but there must be orderliness in the Lord's church whenever it meets. And I believe no shouting down. No shouting each other down. It's not like, you're not like in Congress here. I don't know if you've ever listened to Parliament you know, in Canada. In Parliament in Canada, when, the, when somebody gets up to speak from one of the parties, the other parties can shout, shout him down and talk while he's talking. I mean, it's a zoo. They call it a tradition. I don't know how they ever get anything accomplished, but in the church, Paul says, that's not the way it operates. You take turns to speak, people comment at what you're saying so that the whole church is edified, so that the correct teaching is given and confirmed by others. Then he says women, regardless of their gifts, he doesn't deny that women may have these gifts, whether they can speak in tongues or interpret or prophecy. He says women are not permitted to exercise their gift in the public assembly. Now, the Bible describes women who had gifts. It's not that God did not distribute gifts among women. Philip's daughters, Philip the evangelist, his daughters all prophesied. But Paul instructs them not to use these in public assembly. He says it's improper to do so. Gifts can be used, women who have gifts, for example, can be used with unbelievers to teach them. We have an example of Aquila and Priscilla teaching Apollos in the book of Acts. They can be used uh, to teach and instruct children. We have that example. Uh, Timothy, for example, he learned the gospel from his mother and from his grandmother. They taught him. Um, to teach other women, Lydia had organized a, a prayer uh, group, if you wish, and she was the leader of that. But Paul says here, but not in the mixed assembly. And I mean, uh, in that culture, that would not have been a big issue. Because culturally, that was pretty much how it was among the Jews. The women and the men did not even sit together. So he goes on to 36 and 38, because even among the Greeks, this must have been a difficult, not among the Jews, but among the Greeks, this may have been a difficult teaching to accept, that the women not have this position, not exercise their gifts in the public assembly. So he goes on to say, in verse uh, uh, 36 to 38, he says, was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Isn't that interesting that he puts that passage exactly in that position? because he understood that there would be, you know, there'd be some blowback from what, he just, from what he just said here. So he anticipates protest here over the things he has just instructed and he reminds them of the source of his own authority in these matters and he says, the Lord Himself has given me these commandments concerning public worship. Imagine. Now, the biggest argument against this type of organization in the church um, uh, is based on the idea, uh, what we call the cultural idea. And the argument goes like this. 
Well, Paul grew up at a time when women were subjugated publicly, they had no rights, you know, they, they were not well treated, they couldn't work on their own, they couldn't sue for divorce, you know, they didn't have any rights of any kind and they were subject to their husbands and many cultures were treated like property. So they say it's natural for, P for Paul to have this mindset. It's a cultural mindset. You know, he's putting women down, he's a misogynist, you know, whatever. The only problem with that argument is when he says in verse 36 to 38, is anybody out there think that they're a prophet? In other words, he's saying, do you think you really know God's word? If you're one of the ones that thinks he knows God's word and is rejecting what I'm giving you, please understand that what I'm giving you is the Lord's commandment. And so in the Bible we have to make the difference between what's cultural and what's commandment. Cultural is wearing veils. That's cultural. Remember we talked about that in one of our lessons. It was culture and Paul spoke about it as it fit into culture. Foot washing, that was cultural. The way we conduct public worship, that's commandment. So I'll, I'll even go further. If Paul had said here, uh, because men are boisterous and, 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 and easily provoked and they're violent, we want them to be quiet in the church and let's let the women teach because women are naturally more you know, co uh, collegial, they're much more, you know, they don't like to fight and so on. Let's let the women do the teaching. We'll give them the, well if that's what was written here, then you know, Jeannie would be up here teaching and she's quite qualified to do so and I would be sitting there listening. Why? Because Paul said this is the Lord's commandment, but that's not what he said. So we have to be careful when we hear that argument about culture. We have to discern in the Bible what's culture, what's commandment. Now these instructions are not merely suggestions. As I say, they're commandments from the Lord. If one ignores these in worship, then the worship is ignored by God. And you know, uh, Paul, some say, well, that's just for Corinthians. But if you go into 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 15, Paul repeats the exact same commandment. And this time he's teaching Timothy about what he ought to teach in the various churches where he serves as an evangelist. Well, I don't want to beat this to death, but that's a big, uh, that's a big issue in today's religious world, the role of of, of women in the church. So he goes on in verse 39 and 40 to give a, a summary statement. He says, therefore my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but let all things be done properly and in an orderly manner. So he, he summarizes what he's just said now. First of all, he talks about tongues. He says, um, uh, uh, tongues are not the preeminent gift and they are the cause of problems, but this is not a reason to forbid their use. Use them, but do so in a proper way. And I've heard people use this verse to defend the idea of speak, that speaking in tongues exists today. They say, well look, he says here, don't defend to speak in tongues. Yeah, to those people who were using it improperly, and the temptation when you go too much this way is what? Well, to go too much that way. It's a gift that God gives, you're not using it properly. The answer is not just to shut it down completely. The answer is understand what it's to be used for and use it properly. And then he talks about uh, making sure that everything is done in a properly and an orderly way, meaning avoiding uh, uh, according to the instructions given. Well, let's summarize this. We've got about five minutes left here. We do not possess the miraculous gifts of tongues and interpretation, inspired prophecy, discernment, and revelation today. We don't, we don't have those gifts today. However, we can still accomplish the same goals that these gifts helped the early church to achieve. I mean, we can still today reach the goal of edification, which is building up of the church, exhortation, which is giving direction to the church, encouragement, which is comfort to the church, conviction, which is convicting the church when there is sin, and conversion to Christ. And how do we do that today? Today we have the word of God. The word of God is revealed and recorded in the Bible. Today we have preachers and teachers and elders and deacons and saints who through the ministry of the word edify the church. What does Paul say in Ephesians 4 verse 12? And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, 
to the building up of the body of Christ. So God also equipped the church with individuals, teachers and elders and preachers and deacons and saints. And through the word, we build each other up. We can also direct the church through the word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, every scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be fully equipped for every good uh, work. So the word of God gives us the information we need in order to serve, in order to do what we have to do. We can also comfort the church. Paul says in 1, Timothy, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18, comfort each other with these words. He doesn't say with these miracles, he says with these words. We can convict sinners using the word of God. I don't have to speak in tongues. I don't have to do a miracle to convict sinners. You know, when Peter was preaching, it says they were pierced to the heart. They, were, they felt guilty. They didn't feel guilty because he was speaking in tongues and, and, and they weren't. They felt guilty because they learned that their sins put Christ on the cross. And how did they learn that? Well, he simply preached the word to them. And then bringing souls to Christ. This is my favorite passage, Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed, Paul says, of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Listen to that. I am not ashamed. I, I'm not afraid or ashamed of the word and what it says. Why? Because he says the word is God's power. This has the power to bring people to Christ. And I know that is true because I'm looking at all of you in this class and every single one of you were brought to Christ by the power of the word. None of you came to Christ because of a miracle. You all came because of the word, and that includes, that includes me. So the miraculous gifts are gone, but in their place we have the word of God that empowers us to accomplish the very same objectives. And today we also have the same responsibility to conduct our assemblies in an orderly and a decent fashion. And we do this with reverent behavior and modest dress, not just you know, when I say modest, I don't mean sexy. I'm not, you know, I'm not referring to that part of it. Modest dress, like a, I, you know, I, if I came to teach this morning and I had my Montreal Canadiens jersey on, go Habs go, and I had you know, that, that big sponge finger that says, the Montreal Canadiens are number one, you know, and I kept talking about the, the gospel and pointing to you with that big sponge finger, red finger that said, Canadians are number one, well, would that be decent? Would that be orderly? No, it wouldn't, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with the finger and there's nothing wrong with the Montreal Canadiens, but this would not be the place and this would not be the time for that. That's, that's what decent and orderly is talking about. And we do this also by following Paul's instructions. The preachers and the teachers take turns in class and in the pulpit to minister the word. Different teachers are used at different times for different subjects. And those who oversee and those who have Bible knowledge examine carefully what is taught. And the women exercise their talents in a proper way and at the proper time. And all of this is done in a respectful and orderly fashion. And then finally, we never allow a meeting time to pass without offering the opportunity for those convicted of sin or convinced by the gospel to come before the assembly and acknowledge and request baptism. That's why we do it every time, because we know the word has power and we never know, you know how the Holy Spirit is working in, in each heart. Maybe today will be the day someone will say, I wish to confess Christ and be baptized, or I wish to be restored, or I wish to place myself under the authority of this eldership. So all the things he's talking about there, we're duplicating today in our public assembly by doing all things in a decent and an orderly fashion. 